morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Stephen Kirtley. I'm from the Western Kentucky University. And I'm going to talk today a little bit about our approach to uh, addressing accessibility. <clears throat> um, in our distance learning department, we have a team of instructional designers that work with faculty on their online courses. And um, we utilize students a lot um, uh, for a lot of things that we do. And accessibility is, is one thing that they uh, greatly help us with. Uh, the, uh, we have a couple different groups of students. Um, some students kind of work within Blackboard to address, uh, to address accessibility about um, uh, documents and stuff like that for maybe the visual impaired. Uh, but what I'm going to discuss with you today is our approach for the, uh, the hearing impaired who, um, um, who will be utilizing our uh, uh, media, lecture capture media and stuff like that. So um, to start out, I'm going to give you a little bit of a historical overview um, of what we used to do. Um, I've been working uh, in the distance learning department for a little over a year, and when I came in, they had a list of some things that they really wanted uh, done, and um, uh, revamping the workflow of our transcribing and captioning was one thing that um, they asked me to do. I'm going to give you a little bit of a uh, demonstration of um, um, part of the process, and uh, uh, we'll have some time for some questions whenever. So, we've had about five student um, transcribers um, transcribing each semester. Uh, we, we like to hire our, um, our students to do some of this work um, uh, as opposed to outsourcing. Um, to uh, companies that will do transcribing and captioning for us. Uh, we think it's really great for the students. Uh, it's a great cost uh, savings for us, uh, you know, good experience for the students. We get to work with them closely, so uh, we feel like uh, we're working towards a really high quality um, product that we offer. Um, we, um, we started out with uh, two um, captionists um, who had a little bit more technical expertise um, that would work to time sync the um, transcripts uh, with the videos. And uh, the software that we used uh, was ExpressScribe. It um, uh, is really geared towards, um, you know, uh, processing, listening to um, audio and then um, uh, allowing a, a person to, uh, like a human person, to transcribe. It has a, um, a foot pedal that just plugs into USB and when you press down on the pedal, it plays, and when you let go, it stops. So you can keep your hands on the keyboard without having to, you know, take the mouse over and hit pause, hit rewind, and stuff like that. If you want to rewind a little bit, uh, you, you just touch the side of the pedal, and it will scrub backward or scrub forward. So basically, the audio is controlled by the foot, and uh, that way the student can kind of stop and play and, and rewind if they need to without ever lifting their hands from the keyboard. So I think that's a very important step towards um, an efficient uh, transcribing. Um, and um, to do the captioning, we've utilized YouTube to synchronize our transcripts with a video. Uh, so that's uh, you know, a free service that we can use. And uh, we use Movie Maker some if there's some issues um, with the, the audio file. And, and we were using Tegrity, so every now and then we would have to uh, reprocess kind of a video uh, that was edited before we sent it up to YouTube. So um, historically, this is kind of the process that uh, we used. So you know, it's important for me to show, you, show this to you because if you decide, decide to start using um, uh, your students or doing transcriptions and captionings in-house, uh, you might not have uh, the, the database system to start with. Um, that, that I'll show you um, um, in a little bit. Um, but these are basically the, the basic things that we needed to do uh, to be able to transcribe. So within our uh, lecture capture system, which happens to be Tegrity, there on the left we have an RSS feed. Uh, it's like a podcast feed that um, we can look at a certain course or a faculty member and basically um, retrieve that content uh, in a browser window. Uh, what was great about this level of access is it allowed our students 
who, who were working with us, our student workers, to access these course videos without having to be in the course themselves. So typically, uh, the way our lecture capture system, and we use Blackboard 2, in order to see content, you have to either be a faculty member, a teacher, uh, or, or enrolled in the class. So this was a, a portal that we had to these videos without having to give access um, to all the students. Basically, what was important to us is each one of those links uh, was, was labeled what the video was called. And instead of having a video here, it was just an audio file. And um, I'll explain in a minute why uh, that wasn't the best, but it was sufficient to do um, uh, the transcribing. And it was as simple as clicking on a link and uh, that audio file would download locally. Uh, the reason we wanted it locally is because we were using Expressscribe. Uh, it's a piece of software, it's about $29 and the pedals, you know, 60, under 100, something like that. So it's an affordable approach uh, um, to, to transcribing uh, in-house. And as soon as you downloaded the file, it loaded up in the software. And you see the play and the stop and the rewind and so forth. But by hooking the pedal up to this, it made it powerful and useful to us so that we could use this as an efficient transcribing tool. And um, even though that um, Expressscribe allows you to transcribe within the window, uh, what we do or what we did was uh, we just had a Word document and we would type, uh, the students would type in that. So um, basically, in order to transcribe uh, your videos, you just need uh, to give a student access to a video, uh, some software that kind of helps facilitate that so it's efficient uh, to listen and scrub through. Uh, so the student doesn't have to lift their hands off the keyboard, and then a place to store the um, uh, the text that they have. Not a very complicated process, but um, I, I will explain that some of the issues here were the first step: knowing what needed to be done, knowing what wasn't done before. You know, you had a list of things here, so there was a, a communication um, issue that needed to be resolved. Uh, on the transcriber side to figure out exactly what needed to be done. You know, what RSS feeds do I need to look at? Which videos should I start on and so forth? Uh, the last step here, the Word document. These Word documents had to be stored somewhere, so we just had a file share, we had a folder structure, uh, but knowing what was in progress, who was working on what, and when it was completed, um, that was a problem that we had to overcome from this system. So even though this is basically what you need, uh, because of a lack of management tied around this, uh, there were some issues. Yes, ma'am. Um, sure. So um, uh, the question is, how does Expressscribe help facilitate and um, uh, the transcribing process? So. Uh, the, the foot pedals that, that could come with it that you could purchase, that was a big part of what makes that valuable. Um, but if, if part of your question was, how long does it take to do a five minute video? Um, w one of the things, that was a question we didn't know. <laughs> you know. It was hard to monitor. We had an Excel sheet that basically they were supposed to say what they were working on and um, how long it took and, and so forth. So we can do reporting on that. Wasn't accurate. Um, uh, you know, access Excel files on file shares, only one person can edit at a time. Um, uh, so we did not have that question. But uh, before I show you the report, I'll go ahead and give you a spoiler what the answer is. It takes about uh, maybe two to three minutes to transcribe a minute of video that, that we found. Um, that's averaging about, you know, 35 words per minute, I think. Yes, ma'am? So Expressscribe is, uh, the question is, does it give you the caption? So um, what I've learned about this process is we have transcripts, which is basically you know, the, the typed word from the spoken word, and then the caption, the caption file that, that, we're think, that I'm thinking of is basically that transcript with timestamps. That wasn't the okay. question okay. I was asking. The question was, so when we use Camtasia, you can run it, and it will give you like predictive captions that are already Okay. Uh, no, I do not think it does. 
um, uh, and we definitely don't use it for that means. The question is, does it, um, does it process the video file and suggest what the word could be? Okay. So YouTube is, is a, um, one of the steps that we use, and YouTube has an auto-captioning feature. It is not accurate, uh, <laughs> uh, nor is uh, what we found a lot of other software based. I'm sh they're sure there's some good ones out there, but you're going to be paying a lot for them. Um, typically, maybe around $7 per video minute is what you would be paying for uh, if you um, were using a third party. Uh, at least the, these are some of the numbers that we found, and you have some type of priority, meaning you want it returned within a couple of days. Uh, it's a little cheaper if you, if you can give it a week before it comes back. And also, uh, they, they give a percentage on quality, which I don't know exactly what that means, but if you want a high percentage of quality, you're, you're paying you know, $7 a minute. Um, so the, the quality, I don't know, different companies do it different ways, but they have software based that, that, that addresses it. And the, the cheap one, this, they run it through fast. And the higher ones, maybe they run it through the software twice. Maybe they have a person trying to do edits. Uh, you know, I don't know. I don't know if any of them actually have people that, that do it at that high quality. Hopefully they would. But uh, we have found that we were not happy with, with the level of that quality. So um, we, we've thought about whether or not it's easier to transcribe from scratch or to try to correct. And whenever I've, whenever I've tried it uh, to, to correct one, I get so confused reading <laughs> what is there. And get, you know, I laugh every now and then about you know, what it says because it's, it's so wrong sometimes uh, that I've found that it's just easier typically to go through. Uh, of course, it depends on how accurate it is, but it's, you, you get lost and, and so forth. Okay, so historically, uh, the captioning process was um, using a file share and students would drop um, uh, their documents within a certain course, a certain folder structure, and um, our captioners would look for changes in the dates of those, those folders to know, that, oh, there's something dropped here, I need to look here, and so forth. This is a process that the students came up with their, on their own to facilitate the work that they were doing. So they weren't necessarily told to do this and do that. And there's kind of they, they had some tools, they had some resources, and they maybe had some suggestions, but they kind of came up with this on their own. So the way that I see that from a kind of a, a design perspective to, to try to create this database and management process is, okay, what are the, the minimum things that we need to do this task? What are the students comfortable with already doing? Where are the issues that I, that, that I can step in and over, um, help overcome for them? So um, the, the captioning process uh, hasn't changed too much, but basically we, we have a new file, we figure out what um, uh, video that transcript is associated with, and we send that up to YouTube uh, through, through our lecture capture system. And then after a short period of time, um, 30 minutes to an hour, um, we can download the time stamped. Um, transcript. So basically what we're looking for is a, is a caption file that we can attach back to our lecture capture system and we create that by uploading a transcript, so just flat text, into YouTube. We, we've, a, we've uploaded the video and we've uploaded this plain text and then we give it some time and then we get a caption file. And we find that YouTube does a pretty good job syncing up what the person's saying uh, with what we've typed. Again, YouTube, we're not using YouTube to predict or to try to analyze what we've said. We just want it to put numbers like zero seconds to two seconds, you know, uh, two seconds to eight seconds as far as here's where this text is being spoken. And uh, YouTube does a pretty good job. When we get that file back, When we get that file back, uh, we will attach the caption file um, to our, um, the media within our lecture capture system, and uh, our, our captioners know that they, they play it to figure out whether or not it worked. And it, that's how I know that it, it does a pretty good job. Uh, they, they play in the beginning. Yes, it looks like it's switching when the, the person's um, saying these words. Uh, they play towards the middle of the file. They play towards the end of the file. And sure, there can be some issues there where we don't check, but uh, that's a pretty good 
uh, indication to us whether or not the file's been edited and something has happened within the uh, syncing process. Um, some of the issues that we find is the, the audio file that we would get that the transcribers would use would be different than the video file that we uploaded. And that was an, more of an issue with our lecture capture system, how things were processed, whether or not the faculty edited and so forth, uh, maybe after the fact, um, or between us when we transcribed and when we captioned. Um, so we, we just kept an eye open for that because that was our level of quality um, uh, as far as what we were presenting to the student. So, um, you know, there, there were some uh, limits to the approach that I mentioned and um, uh, tracking and reporting uh, was a big issue and um, a lot of things after, after uh, revamping this approach, I've learned a lot more about the details as, as far as the issues that we've had. Uh, so having a, um, a centralized system or a management of this process uh, was very valuable and um, um, it is allowing us to, um, to think about some other things as opposed to trying to figure out just what needs to be done and who's doing it and, you know, and, and so forth. Uh, we can start thinking about more like quality and uh, turnaround speed and, and, and hiring new people justifies justifying costs and stuff like that. So our revamped approach um, is um, is web based. We we still use um, ExpressScribe uh, in the pedal. So that's something that we have local, but the management of this process is all done um, um, via the web. So uh, I have a, a passion and uh, expertise is uh, developing uh, databases and, and uh, web pages, web applications. And so I created a database uh, that would um, uh, start addressing uh, the different steps and the different issues that I, I noticed when I came in. And uh, during this process, um, I kind of did it in steps to figure out, well, what, what's the first thing that I should work on? What's the, the, the problem that they have the most? Rather than trying to develop, excuse me, rather than trying to develop the whole thing and um, um, presenting it to them at once. So um, first thing that I was thinking of was like, okay, these videos that are coming in, these, these courses that we want to monitor and to transcribe, um, we, had, um, uh, we had a way to, to insert the, the podcast URL to start monitoring that course. So once we did that, it pulled in all the videos that we needed to do and put them into um, to a database. So within that database, we can then do something else. We can prioritize a certain course and a certain video. So again, we started with how did they do it before, how did they kind of want to do it, and I was kind of trying to replicate that by trying to eliminate some of the issues. So by having a, a, a database where we can um, uh, monitor and record uh, everything that needs to be done and, and the priority uh, of those things, then um, uh, that was our first step. So um, we have a couple different views here. Um, under the navigation on the top, um, you can see we have courses, um, videos, transcriptions, and captions. So uh, the courses view basically allows us to look at a course level um, um, that we've been monitoring from our lecture capture system. And it organizes it in a way where it lets us know whether or not we've activated or deactivated the course, whether or not we've said this course is a priority or it isn't a priority. And within that, um, we can determine whether or not uh, our videos have been captioned or not. So with our lecture capture system, there wasn't a good way to, to pull that information, but what they were doing previously was renaming the videos with CC at the end. And so that, again, there was a manual process when we attached that caption file, so one of the steps that they did was manually rename that. So that's how we were able to ter determine that. So since that was a, uh, a great consistent way that they were um, processing these videos, uh, then I'll just use that to figure out whether or not it's been captured or not. So when we monitor a course, 80% of the videos maybe were already captioned, so I can look at the 20% that haven't been, and then out of those we can figure out, well, oh, this one looks like it's a duplicate for some reason, the faculty uploaded two, we're going to deactivate one of those videos. So we're already solving some problems where we can 
we can see what needs to be done, what workload that we have ahead of us. Uh, we can um, prioritize and, and remove some videos that, that we don't want transcribed. So we're saving time there by not transcribing uh, something that doesn't need to be transcribed. And, and we still struggle with that. Uh, there's so many areas where um, we, we could accidentally pull in a duplicate video because our transcription system allows us to make, or not a transcription, our lecture capture system allows us to make copies of videos. So if we start monitoring something else, it could be a copy of a video that doesn't have a caption, but we might have that sitting there elsewhere. Uh, so we're, we're always trying to make sure that we, we um, only transcribe what needs to be transcribed. Um, the, the interface here is just collapsible, uh, just kind of developed. We're, we're going to come up with a, uh, a little bit better way to present this, which uh, hopefully I'll have time a little later to discuss, but uh, it's nested in a way where the, the things that are important are up at the top and the things that aren't are kind of down deep. Uh, but I wanted a way where, where even the administrators can come in and see everything. Um, but to make it easier in the transcribers, we, had, we have a page specifically for them. And when they click on, um, or excuse me, this is the course view. So if you were to click on a course and you're basically focusing in on that course, you get some information about the course title, you can link to the feed, uh, maybe how many days since we've checked that feed to look for new videos. Um, we can set the priority and, uh, and active status. And um, as we're working through this, um, something I guess I haven't emphasized is um, during the first year I basically created the shell of the system, what, what was necessary to kind of do this work. And where we had started with two captioners, we now have five students working uh, in that area. Uh, not because we need that many people to do captioning, but because they've had some um, programming skills, computer science skills, that uh, is helping me to develop the system. So they are working, so I have students working off the shell that I created adding new features. So whenever we have someone say, oh, this is an issue, or I wish we can add this, something could be better, then one of the students jumps in and develops that. And so an example here, and I know it's probably hard to see, but towards the right, uh, we have uh, two little tabs there for attachments and um, um, add a video. But the, the, uh, the add a video is there because we wanted to be able to do third-party videos, not just videos that were in our lecture capture system. We have faculty in our courses that use links to YouTube, CNN, you know, PBS, stuff like that. And even though we can't caption those videos, we can transcribe them. And so in order to get them into our system, since they're not in the RSS feed from our lecture capture system, we can add a link to a video one at a time. Uh, the attachments is there, and it's also under the video level. Um, because um, since our students are not looking at the video of the, the professor presenting, uh, they're not seeing the PowerPoint slides that they have and so forth. And some of the topics, um, uh, some of the words might uh, be hard to spell, um, hard to understand, maybe some of the professors. And so we can attach the course materials that we have access to from within Blackboard uh, that they are using. So by adding those videos, that was a, an issue that uh, our student transcribers had. Uh, it, it solved that issue. They were able to um, to look at the video or follow the PowerPoint as they were uh, listening and they were getting a lot of good hints as far as, oh, here's how you correctly spell this word and, and this is the context that they mean and so forth. So, um, you know, since we had a system that um, didn't distract us from figuring out what we needed to do and what was next and so forth, we were able to focus on something that improved the quality and, and the turnaround time of our transcribing. Yes, ma'am. You mentioned Blackboard. Uh, I just wasn't clear, is this is integrated to an OPI with Blackboard? Um, it is not. Um, we haven't needed um, to do that. This is just kind of a, an in-house uh, database that we use. The lecture capture system is integrated with Blackboard, but we access the lecture ca capture system directly to get that list of videos. So uh, we were using Integrity uh, at the time, so we have access to uh, their RSS feed and podcast feeds. Uh, we are um, talking about moving to a media site, and they have an API. And so I'm excited about being able to use that API uh, to connect to it directly to, to automate some of these tasks. 
the, uh, the, the connection with Blackboard, um, <clears throat> I guess, is useful, or, or the way we utilize that is we have our instructional designers in certain Blackboard courses. So if we need content out of the course, I can contact an instructional designer and say, I need all the PowerPoints from this, this course because our transcribers are having issues. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so uh, we have, yeah, okay, the question, okay, the question is, uh, do our faculties let us go into uh, their, their course and do things? So uh, something I didn't mention is we have, um, in, we have these videos coming in from a couple different ways. We have not been told by anybody that we need to do that. We've, we've just taken it upon ourselves to help improve the level of these courses. No one else in, on our campus is, is providing the service. The faculty is not going in there creating transcripts and captions. So with our instructional designers, we have um, course development agreements that we work with faculty. Uh, we pay them an extra stipend to be able to, to for us to work closely together. Uh, our hopes are to help them produce high quality online courses. And that's one reason why we're doing this is because we can't necessarily get them to do that or see, always see the importance. But this is a service we feel like we can provide to them. So part of the uh, agreement process is that they have to allow us access to their course. So if they want to get that extra money, then they have to allow us access. So um, we have access through that means for the course developments that we are directly working with faculty on. Uh, some faculty we have a little bit of pushback. It's like, why do you need in my course? And you know, part of it's because we're going to review their documents. Uh, another reason is because we are going to um, uh, try to make their their uh, their media uh, more accessible. Another means of uh, revenue, not revenue. Um, another another source of videos that we know we need to transcribe comes directly from our uh, student disability uh, department. So we'll have a, a course that our instructional designers don't know anything about, but all of a sudden we'll be notified, oh, we have a student that needs transcripts and captions. Great, okay, what, what course is it? Uh, and if w what we do is we, we contact the faculty and ask, do you have videos that you use? Sometimes they, they d don't want to even answer that question, which I don't understand. Um, but then other times they do, yes or no. <clears throat> and if they do, then um, you know we can easily look. I have it admin rights to our lecture capture system, so I can search for their name and their course title, since it is tied with our, uh, our LMS, and figure out if they at least use Tegrity for it. Um, we actually have to have access to their course or at least be provided links if we need to know about the third party. Um, but um, they don't really have a leg to stand on the, I mean, if <laughs> we're being asked to, to try to help them make this accessible. So uh, they, they really have never had a good argument to not, uh, not help us out with that because we are trying to do most of the work for it. But, um, but yes, so, so sometimes they let us, sometimes they don't. Um, Um, uh, at the university level, I've been given uh, administrative rights to the lecture capture system. Uh, if they use a third party, I don't necessarily know which videos they might be using. Um, the, the videos we don't redistribute, we don't share, uh, we are just looking at it in-house. So. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, um, uh, when the transcribers come in, they have a slightly different view here. Basically, uh, they get to look at some videos that, that have already been started, the transcription process, and whether or not it's one that they've started and so forth. Uh, this hierarchy uh, is something that we're going to be going away from soon because there is some digging and there is some a little confusion as far as what I should be working on and so forth. So what we are wanting to move towards, since we have all this in the database, is just basically a view that will show them a list of videos that they should be doing now. And that, that would be determined by whether or not uh, there's a student in need in this semester right now. That, so we have a priority course, uh, whether or not um, it's a, an on-demand course. On on-demand courses, we, we transcribe all those uh, videos. Uh, if they are under contract, we will do those. And it's kind of the order that we have. And I just want to present them with, with groups like that. But right now, I'm presenting them everything, trying to move things to the top and giving them a choice. I'm going to start taking away that choice and just kind of present them with something like, okay, you're sitting down, here you go. 
and I'm, I'm thinking that will allow us to, to work through, um, through it a little better, but I haven't come up with that view yet, so I don't have that to show you. Um, by clicking on a, um, well, let me go back real quick. Down at the, um, or towards the middle, down towards the bottom, uh, we have a specific um, uh, video. It has the name of the video that we can click on to actually go into it. Um, it has some links for us to toggle it to the active status. It gives them some information about the duration of this video. Uh, in this example, this transcription has already been started. There's a link for the MP3. It happens to be 6.4 megs. And then the author of the video is listed. So that's some information we have. And that's just some information that we forgot on this screen. And this, um, this is what our transcribing window looks like now. So I mentioned earlier that I kind of did things in phases. So when I first had the database, it was just to maintain the courses and what needed to be done and to provide the students links to get the MP3. At that step, they still used ExpressScribe and they still used Word documents. But then, you know, a couple months later, I was able to work on the transcribing part, which is basically just a text area window that we can type in. And uh, as they type every few seconds uh, up to a minute, it will automatically save to a database. So um, they, they get their pro uh, progress recorded. And that uses um, um, the database to store everything. So we're, we're moving things towards a centrally located area. And we were able to move away from the file share and those Word documents and stuff like that. Um, you know, just another example of uh, something that um, helped the students greatly was originally when they downloaded an MP3 from the podcast, there was this really random GUID, uh, just a string of characters, maybe 26 characters long or something, that was just random. That prevented just anybody from saying, oh, I'm going to try to access this MP3. You know, you had to really guess, guess that. So when they downloaded that file, you know, it didn't make sense. They would have to rename it. Um, when they created their Word document on the file share, they would have to create a name for it, create the folder structure. All that was done by the student, and each student did it a little differently. And uh, we had our transcribers working in one side of the building and our captioners working in the other, and they never talked to each other other through this file share. So there was a lot of confusion of which video did this go to and so forth, which is one of the reasons they probably listened to it after they they uh, synced it up is because they could have synced it up with the wrong video. And if they're not hearing those words at those appropriate times, then that could be an issue um, uh, as far as that. So um, this, one of the first things that our transcribers do is download the MP3 file. In this system right here, basically we'll take the course name and the video name, and when you download it, it suggests that name. And basically, you know, when we use Firefox, it'll download, download it, open it up in ExpressScribe with one click, and we will see the name of that file, which is the course name and the video name. So we've, we've been able to use the system to eliminate that uh, margin of error that our students introduced. Uh, we also simplified the process. And down the line, it was already helping our uh, captioners is because the, the, the text files and stuff that, that we would generate here have the proper names and so forth on them. Um, so we, we had some, um, over there on the left, is uh, kind of some, some buttons that we can click. Uh, some of them just give us some information, some of them we can actually kill, click. And we've been adding to that. So like if we have an issue with a video, the transcriber can click that and move on. Um, if they think the video needs to be reviewed by somebody because they're not 100% on the quality of this, this content, uh, they can click that button. And, and we have some graduate assistants now that will go in and look through and help kind of verify, yeah, those look like they're the right words or, or this or that. Uh, by being able to attach the PowerPoints and present those to our student transcribers. Um, that was um, to address some of these needs that they thought they had, so they were able to produce some, um, some better transcripts coming in. Uh, by using Firefox, uh, um, we have some plugins that we could download for uh, additional dictionaries. So at the time that I was developing this, we were doing some nursing courses. And so there are some medical terms that a typical dictionary doesn't pick up. Uh, but it, within Firefox, um, there was a, a third party download that we could download that would um, uh, supplement the, the spell check that was built in. 
And, you know, uh, uh, and this is a slightly older view, though the navigation looks a little different, but this is what our, um, our, our captioners would see is basically what needs to be captioned, and they could work on the priority ones first and so forth. And again, everything's here in one place. They can just check back here to figure out what works needs to be done. They don't have to go to a file share and look for it, potentially never see something or skip over something. It will stay here until the video gets renamed with CC, and it doesn't get renamed until they actually do their steps. So, um, uh, question, one of the first questions that we had was, how long does it take us? Um, I was talking a little bit about cost. You know, we were thinking that our process was cheaper than $7 a minute uh, to do. And so one of the goals of, of doing this is to be able to track a lot of things and uh, to report on it. So um, uh, I'm going to just briefly describe some of what this report does. And it's, it's very customizable. As you hover over things, it gives you a lot of information. As you click on things, it'll, it'll filter and pivot. Uh, so it's... There's a lot of information here, but you can drill in and ask very specific questions without me having to, to create some more reports. Um, uh, but there on the, the first column on the left, um, I'm looking at the year 2015. So each, uh, each row is basically a month. So down at the bottom is January, and we worked with uh, 14 unique courses. We did 100 unique videos, uh, 15 dif different authors, and we had 11 transcribers working. Now, earlier I mentioned we had a number of five, and uh, that 11 is, is padded a little bit because every now and then I go in and make a change, so I'm technically a transcriber, even though you know, I might only do a few words. Our captioners might go in and make a few, a few changes or touch a few things, so it, it will record them. I can easily just hover and look at those names, and I kind of realize um, uh, who, who's... Um, who's accessing there. And if I happen to click on one of those people, it would, would filter this whole view and only show me that person, so it gives me an idea of how much they're actually doing. Um, uh, towards the top here on um, 7 July, uh, we've worked with 31 unique courses. We've uh, done 326 unique videos, uh, 81 unique authors. Um, the reason that's kind of high would be a good question as I hover and it would tell me the reason is we're doing a lot more third party um, right now or at least in this month. Something we didn't do at first but I kind of built that in because that was a feature that we needed and uh, we, uh, we have 12 transcribers working right now and if we go back a couple of months uh, we have 26 transcribers. Well the reason that one was high is because we have an interview process where we, we brought in our uh, some students who wanted to transcribe and we let them do a um, speed test uh, to kind of see how fast they were, and we asked them to transcribe about 10 to 20 minutes of a video. And so during our interview process, we were getting some work done, which we learned later needed just to be redone <laughs> for, for most of those. Um, but um, that's the, why the number was high, is because they were actually using the system. They got to see how, what they would be doing. So there was no question of, oh, I didn't know how tedious this, this is or, or this and that. They know exactly what they're doing, what they interact with, and, and um, uh, we were able to test that. So within the last month, I guess, I developed a, uh, an interview feature where when a student logs in, and if it's not one that we know about, basically it will clone a video that we've said this is the video we want our students to do so rather than having to do in different videos we've learned that if they do the same one we can compare apples to apples and uh, figure out oh they they this student typically gets hung up on this or that or the other or or they've they've excelled at it and it, it makes it easier for the person that did the reviewing which is also a graduate assistant a student uh, or at least uh, provided the report to to the administrators as far as it. Uh, next couple of columns here, and ask any questions. Uh, we have a few minutes left uh, that you want, but I'm going to list some of the metrics that we're getting out of, of using this. Uh, next column tells us uh, what partial transcription time we've done. This gives us an idea of work in progress. So as of this month, currently we had two days and 20 hours of partial work done. Uh, that, that's a high number, and I can justify that a little bit about so these are some of the videos that have been marked for needing review or something. So maybe 90% 90, 90 of it's been done, maybe 100% of it's been done. It just needs to be finalized and, and looked at before we, uh, we, we push it on. 
um, completed transcription time, this is where the students say, I am done with this video. It can be captioned. Uh, currently this month, we have 11 days of completed uh, transcription time. That means uh, we've had students working um, 11 hours of, of student, uh, or 11 days worth of student um, uh, worker hours and so forth. Um, uh, total transcription time, um, uh, so we have average video duration, 20, 30 minutes. Uh, earlier it was about 13 or so, so we kind of have an idea of how long these videos are. Um, uh, average time per minute, I see two minutes and 40 seconds for this month per video minute. So it takes our transcribers almost three minutes to transcribe one minute of um, a video. And uh, I see one over three minutes, but most of them are closer to two. Um, I know how much we pay our student workers. Uh, I think it's around $8 eight we, we start. And so we're able to calculate um, how much does it cost per video minute. And we're looking at about 36 cents for the, for the transcriber. Um, cost. Our captioners don't spend a lot of time. It's more of push and wait and pull and, and attach. So we don't have all that factored in, but we feel that a very aggressive number towards the $7 a minute. Uh, plus we, we get to work with our students and so forth. Uh, average words per minute and, and stuff like that. We also have some metrics. So um, these were some numbers that we did last year, uh, like 598 transcripts. Um, and comparing it to this year, we have just under a thousand that we've done so far up into July. Uh, so this is something that we're we're getting more efficient at. We're we're um, uh, burning through uh, these videos a lot faster. One of the issues that we have is not pulling in videos uh, quick enough for some of our transcribers. Uh, about once a week, I have a transcriber comes in that comes in my office and says, "I don't see any more videos for me to do." So we have to scramble to find another course of 10 or 20 videos so they can start working on that. They're, they're, they're getting that efficient at working through this process. Um, so um, um, time is up. If you have any questions, feel free to ask me. But um, I'd like to thank you. And hopefully um, this is something that you can use to save some money and, and utilize a student workforce, the organization.